Well, first of all, well, good morning. I have to apologize, first of all, because I couldn't be here yesterday. If I tell you something that you heard yesterday, then please be patient with me. I read this morning in the newspaper that the majority of Germans believe in the extraterrestrial. And we'll talk about pictures and graphics today. And you certainly remind your own childhood comics and superheroes. Of course, this is the topic here is Superman himself is well, a well person with a migratory background, if you like. So science fiction contributed a lot to deal with the topic of an indirect experience. And the comic itself was created by Jewish migrants who actually left Europe for the fear of fascism and created uh, or used the superhero idea to get away from uh, this and also take part in resistance. So this is a part that is not always uh, well cl classified as criticism or as commitment in society, but this is also right of existence. What I'm interested in here is the question of how in graphics we can negotiate that topic, and I brought you a whole range of books that I would like to introduce you to. We start out with a comic that a British college wrote in cooperation with a young teenager that escaped from Iran and together with a British Red Cross this was published to make the public aware what the destiny, the fate of this uh, young boy was. And this is one part of the story, it has a specific function and many people um, are involved here. So the picture uh, makes sure that there is a universal story, so it's a community experience that is created. And my first suggestion is that actually, so, uh, as a cultural factor, you just see this as a cultural technology that creates a universal language or community experience. But this is uh, often said that the picture is a universal picture and overcomes language barriers. I think this is seen by many people who deal with the graphics depiction, but this is not what I'm most interested in. Do you know his art picture? Chantal, an Australian uh, graphics producer. Chantal, in that case, is a serial picture. You see uh, the well, threat and the dangers in the place that he actually came from originally. And from the book, uh, I don't know whether you read it, it's the self-organization uh, of, of refugees, that is the content of the book. I dealt with that and in that narrative, the actors are sitting under a monument in Berlin, which actually shows socialist uprise. And the question is about the end of socialism, or what this was thought to be. Now, what happens with those monuments set in stone when they're actually beyond uh, the story that they actually had an importance of? When I read this, I thought this also is a good question to the narrative in pictures, so the graphics novel. Now, this is the sort of graphics novel that just lost language in a way. And if we are just confronted with a picture now and have to ask ourselves, what is the narrative behind it? Because the picture uh, shows us very clearly. And I call it a visual creation. So actually, from the picture, we have to see the true story. Shantan is a surreal uh, picture of graphics novelist. So this is uh, from the red tree here, and he creates a picture of himself. Yeah. Well, actually, the understanding of himself, yeah. so also to, to understand himself and take something for granted, this does not work with language. He takes the picture to show that. We also say it, and you, you have a picture of something in your mind, and this is a picture of the, the, the girl here, creates a picture of herself. 
why do we take a picture? We could also have a story without a picture. But what does the picture show us? What does we need the picture for? And we open up a space beyond language. And this is what he wants to say in this, in this uh, excerpt here. When we don't have the picture alone and have language attitudes, language always wins over the picture. The importance of language is so great that basically we don't think that the image can actually be competitive to a language. We just rely on, for example, something that is said underneath the picture, as a legend. So, for example, the sentence here could be Syrian girl in a refugee camp. Now, this is what counts then. And Sean Tan also designs the pictures in a serial way to make sure that actually language is not missed by uh, people who look at it. So it's a visual uh, poetry actually that you see. This is an excerpt from a very extensive graphic novel from a Finnish colleague and I'll talk about this in a minute. And uh, he was working with migrant organizations and workers uh, in particular in the food yards and in, in Spain and he wrote a very complex novel about migration and it could only be published um, because Finland was the host country of the Frankfurt uh, book fair so they had extra money it's a very complex uh, novel. I think it's about 35 euros. It's quite expensive. It's a very complex story that he tells. What is particular here is the great diligence in which the discussions amongst the migrants are depicted. So they have uh, their own, or we are right in their housings and experience how new arrivals are integrated and we see the work environment but also how they try to resist the southeast movement and not be recruited. So the internal heterogeneity of the group that does nothing in common actually apart from the fact that they're all someone some escaping from somewhere. And this is the point that I just uh, wanted to take out of this very complex book. This is very uh, difficult when we talk about migration and refugees. We just try, or we just assume that there is a sort of similarity, but there is no similarity. They don't have anything in common. It's just the existential need they're all in. So in an interview, he said, this is one scene from the book, the, the workers uh, talk to each other and when they overcome their fear, when they tell their story, then they all have the hope that this counting story has a sort of consequence. Publishing the book and making people aware of the story to an audience that this will change their situation. And I think this is a sort of promise that pictures or basically pictures that tell the truth in a way that this is a context that is established by those pictures. And the question is whether we as readers can pick up or can actually meet that promise or want to meet it. It's more than a classic novel that is just inviting us, inciting us to get into another world of thought. But this is an appeal of those stories to us. The question is how we can deal with it. Now this opposition of fiction and fact, and a fictional narrative and a documentary, is an important topic in dealing with this form of literature and also in children's literature. So is that true? What it could be? Is it a true story? And a movie, for example, that you see in the cinema and is based on a true story, uh, normally has an additional strength, additional power 
at the end it normally says, uh, well, this is based on a true story. So it gives another importance to the story itself. It's more than just a new narrative. But I believe, uh, I'll explain that uh, later on, the term here, it's not an opposition that we create, you know, the contrast between fact and fiction. But this, they actually meet halfway. And it plays or non space, but it's a utopian space. So if I look at a poet, it's which is something that is searching for new forms of expression because what we have in pictures and languages you cannot express what you actually want to say but it creates the space and this is art to create a space to create and generate an experience that we cannot describe with other means so it comes from left from the left hand side from the right hand side you see a term that is not so favorite today but uh, Michel Foucault has it in his writings. It's a form of narrative that is not only telling a true story, but a form of narrative in which the narrator, narrator is actually putting himself at stake. So in the context of migration, this is in particular gaining importance. So we know the idea that truth is being told. And for example, we think of Edward Snowden and the whistleblower, etc. So people want to tell their story and they put something at stake by telling it. Croatia, this is a term that fits also this context here. Migrants talk to each other and then decide whether they actually want to talk to the person writing the book whether it is worth going the risk, running the risk of telling the true story. And I wasn't sure whether this was difficult to translate, so I have it in English here on the screen. Now we continue with the same question. The question we have to answer is, is it really true what they say? And this question of doubt is always raised when we have a sort of documentary to deal with in the news or, for example, if a picture comes up of a small boy drowned in the sea. This was in the news with the pictures. It's a very, a very powerful image, a very powerful picture. There are many commentators who talk about a turn in refugee policy. I think sometimes that is a bit too much for, for children. But the question comes up time and again, what is the effect of those forms of presentation? And Hitos Dial, this is a documentary creator, it also raises the question whether the picture is true. It's not a question we have to answer, but however, it makes more sense to say in principle that this doubt is just part of those uh, stories of truth. And it is also what, they def what defines them. And there, the two stories or the two contexts get in touch with each other, art and documentary, because doubt always opens up the question whether it could have been different. And this is the question of fiction. So the question of fiction, of the possibility, is always included in every documentary, also in our news on, on TV. It's a very conventional format in every documentary, in every picture you see, in every statement, there is still the possibility hidden that it could have been different. This is not a sort of shortage, but it is just what is a characteristic of this form of narrative. A German pop theory is on Universalist also uh, thought about the comics, Dietmar Dart, and together with a colleague he drafted a comic that among other things also deals with migration, but in that case it deals with a sort of work migration between Europe and Japan, so not the form of migration that is now in the forefront of the news. But he also contributed an afterwards. So he thought of precisely that question. Now, what is the relationship between fiction and truth? And he says, well, basically, if 
fiction or fictionality, so non-truth of what happened. If we accept it, then it is even more true than or truer than before. So it is well, actually, difficult to understand, maybe, but it's something that I think is worth thinking about, and I also believe it is true. I don't know who of you saw Matrix. Yes, you remember the first scene, someone is sitting there and gets two pills to choose from, a red and a blue one, and one stands for reality and one stands for fiction, and he decides, of course, to go for fiction, to understand fiction, etc. So there's a cultural philosopher, Zizek, he actually got into this scene and thought what I'm missing is a third pill. And the third pill allows me to understand what fiction uh, is actually connected to reality. If you think of um, of reality, for example, Schreiber and Varoufakis, I mean, they're not just two people discussing with each other and, and two experts, it's two fictions meeting each other. So, two uh, true stories and action based stories. So, we always ask about the fiction and the fiction and reality, but sometimes it's the very core of what's happening that the actual place of social change is not always. Uh, the, the uh, financial accounting, but actually it goes much deeper. So in fiction, you have to go down to fiction. The story or history has to be changed in a way that the absurdity that is around having my topic of migration, this shouldn't uh, appear as normality. And there, fiction is quite powerful and more powerful than individual children's book. I actually wanted to uh, close with a few examples. Maybe you know that Heine Kleist, the fictionalized story of an Olympianist who fled to Europe. So it's an example of how direct the translation can be done, the individual uh, stories that are also universal. So here, this is a story of a drawer, and uh, there you also have a migration background. You see uh, a boy and who told um, his parents that he goes to school and left the country actually. Very fascinating story. And this is uh, something I want to contrast with this book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Have you seen that? It's also um, an animated film. Because it's not book, no book actually. It all has to deal with migration, not only migration, here yeah, migration. Uh, well, they are here in Europe, for example, to, to study. It's just a part, a normal part of everyday life at the Ivory Coast that is described here. But it's not, for example, just relating to migration and migrating to Europe only. So I think it's a very meaningful, well, not a warning, but an idea. But we shouldn't go the mistake that we only relate the stories to Europe only. So that every story of migration has to point to Europe in a way, a sort of um, well, center of good people, so to speak. But in the longing to understand what people think and what they um, feel, that we normally make Europe uh, the very center, the very goal of them. It, well, if no, it's not. I mean, if they don't make their lives here, they go to the US. But reading. Uh, the books here are very good, and if you see the picture of the uh, small boy at the beginning, we maybe could also talk about the self-understanding of the people reading those books. So we automatically assume that those books come to us, that they point to us, and they only do that in an exceptional way. A few other examples that I'm interested in personally 
Well, this is about Iran in the 80s. And here this is a story that deals with the Near East and the Middle East. And maybe you heard the Maria Mott Prize is awarded to someone who, from the point of view from other migrants, is not deserving the award because he is well, say negative things about uh, the negative things of uh, the Arabic humanism, which is uh, there in the 80s, uh, was discussed in the 80s. And there I thought, well, I go back to the idea at the beginning, seeing the graphics as the um, motive of something having, in co having something in common. It's not easy to understand everything. The, 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 of course, the violence and what they experience but we have to deal with a social context what is actually also hidden and is abstracted from those biographies and just remind us how incredible this is that it's not enough to say it's a Syrian refugee and this doesn't say anything at all what is Syrian refugee what is the story and to say at the same time if we have discussion here. The cultural minister mentioned that as well. How can we organize our educational system to make sure that we can integrate those people into our society? What are our resources? And I think this type of new or graphic novel, it's a sort of picture of a social novel, a graphics novel, it can help us. And maybe it's only on the surface, first of all, but can help us to see and sort out the complexity of the decision. So this is actually my hope that this uh, can help us in some way in dealing with this incredible task that lies ahead of us. So this actually, um, well, is more than everything we had to deal with in the last decades, and that we need support. And I think that graphics novels and graphics as such can help us. This was it. So this is a comic, by the way, um, published by Le Monde. You will have seen it. I uh, thought it was fascinating. On the one hand, you just had the characters, and they were just put into uh, the characters just were put into this, this social, social situation here. They were just in there, and, and suddenly uh, there were bombs and people are shot so out of nothing and then he says uh, well I need help and I ask Dumbledore to help and he doesn't come of course and then it's just black that nothing is left and this is my sort of melancholic conclusion then it's actually the beginning so with the empty sheet with the black sheet with the empty sheet we can start again and think of what kind of story we can tell after that. Again, these are the books that I mentioned and the pictures where I got them from. And this was it. Thank you. A very interesting contribution that picks up the topic of writing between the different worlds from the perspective of the imagery. And with that, I think of the notion of uh, painting between the worlds. Painting between different worlds. Well, you have a huge palette shown us a huge palette of different styles from Finland, from Japan, from very different backgrounds, from Iran. And I noticed in this that, uh, of course, with these two pictures, there are many cultural differences expressed. What do you think, how is the, what is the reception here in Germany like, where we receive these pictures, of course, where they are recommended to us, where we read them, where we try to use them, maybe in, at schools or in different places? What are your experiences, how do people deal with that, with, with these different backgrounds, with these cultural inputs? 
I am teaching myself, but uh, that it, it only refers to the to the moving picture, so I cannot really say that much about literature, but I studied literature myself, and I think that um, we have to ask the question, we have to wonder if it is enough to use the, the picture and the word against each other, or if they if in, in such a culture that we have that is visually um, based, uh, we cannot just think that picture and text always have to stick together, always belong together. Also, the transmission of culture needs the visual part. How to deal with that? I don't know. But I know that one way to do this, for example, in teaching is that media and film, moving pictures, um, have, have gotten a certain, a certain value now and that uh, the visual narrative in this of course can transmit a lot of competences for example when I'm working with film in my courses most of what I want to teach I can show that with a image from arts um, the camera for example the, the basic structures of the visual and of course uh, come to the question what do I have uh, what possibilities do I have from the stylistic point of view what comes from manga what does not come from uh, from comic traditions which you could see also in some of those uh, pictures that I've shown here and then just use that use that in, in, in teaching I don't think that there's a simple answer to this question it's much more an invitation to say uh, this doesn't take us any further. Here's literature without the picture, here's literature with the picture, and to use them against each other. But just simply to try and rely or try and consider it mixed forms. Chantan, for example, in his works, uh, works completely without text, and with that to try and write texts or write literature. The cultural knowledge that the children and adolescents already bring in uh, can be can be understood by that as well and just to reduce that to the arts teaching I think is also very problematic we have to we could for example say let's take a look at the narration and then take a look at what is happening in the pictures in there and then see what happens but with the different biographies of the children of course they will also bring a lot of different feedback to the to the courses. And already now in the reception history there are a lot of differences nowadays if you compare that to the 50s or the 60s. You mentioned the US, you mentioned Superman, then came the manga wave that is still continuing. And now with Shantan there's new directions, new cultural spaces that have become successful in Europe as well, but that come from all over the world of course. Thankfully enough, are translated as well into European languages. So do you think that these are things that are just on vogue, that just trends that we have to face? <coughs> we are organizing a comic symposium, for example, each year as well, and I can easily follow with that uh, the trends and find out what's happening. I'm very interested in graphic novels as well. Much more actually in the classic uh, 48 to 60 page um, editions because the graphic novel, the, the pictures actually decide how long the book will be. This is a niche in, for publishing houses. The graphic novel department there usually just makes up a few people and if something is happening there then, uh, then uh, half that department will have to work on it. That really is a niche on the book market but with view to the possibilities in this it uh, it would actually have a lot of more possibilities with the, Im the imagery culture, with all of the pictures that come from outside. The picture narrative has a lot to give us. I'm also thinking in a historian way here, even though the graphic novel is uh, seen as a, a back translation to Eisner from the 60s, it still has its own tradition here in Europe as well. The, uh, the European comics actually are much older than the, the US comics. 
or I'm thinking of uh, Franz Masary, the Belgian illustrator, who, and I think it was uh, a comment by Mr. Zweig, who created very early graphic novels. We have a, a huge, let's say, pool of things that we can take from this cultural, from these different cultural traditions and backgrounds that we can introduce into this genre. And the, the, the visual uh, narrations that he gives us uh, also allow us that we don't draw back onto national traditions or national cultures and can deal with this. By this, the uh, the narrative, uh, the, the picture narrative can also contribute to this. Yesterday we criticized, uh, uh, Dr. Ette criticized um, the that what we have in literature on this now is something that we should uh, give up. What do you think about graphic novel? How is that discussion held in graphic novel in, uh, in picture books that are, that are dealing with this topic? Are these uh, exile graphic novels, for example? How do you deal with the subject? Do we need something new, maybe, a new movement in there? But I think on one hand, if you, if you take a look at it from the economic point of view, of course that goes in a very slow way. But in marketing and public relations you have to find a compromise, of course, and to say, well, you have this, this social discussion now about migration, about refugees, and I will then, of course, start market and launch books, that on the one hand. On the other hand, like everywhere in literature, you have to move on and uh, you will have certain tendencies that will have difficulties to accept the, the other mess of cultural backgrounds and to, to transmit, to transport those, so that in the end we will not end up with limiting things again and saying, well, this is an authentic biography, this is not an authentic biography, we have to put everything in there, the flight, the uh, repression, and so on. There is this discussion going, going on already, also how to negotiate about this. Um, not every story can take this burden of authenticity. And in this, there is a new lightness in narration that doesn't even think about this. And I think that from this, there is a, a much greater diversity now deriving as an answer to the recent situation. Uh, we have, of course, more resources as well for translation with use to the situation now. So now we, current uh, comics from other countries are taken much easier and faster into translation, which took much longer before. And with that, we have this this immediate effect. It's not like real-time uh, reporting, but still it's not books that have been written 20 years ago. And so we're moving within the same reality, and this literature, this book, talks to me from a presence that I experience myself. And in this, I think, there is the point where it is necessary and important to use these books uh, to talk about migration, migratory background, also because it, this limits, of course, the, the audience and lets the books um, be perceived in a less complex way than they actually are. Migration is not the existential mode or the existential drive of some books that we talked about, but it's also conceived in a lightness that uh, that kind of seems too relaxed for us uh, with views to the current situation but still this is part of, a, of this individual experience but it doesn't explain everything of course multilingualism the, uh, the the, the wording in graphic novels is very little, that's also because, that's also why they can be translated that fast, but multilingualism wins, of course, so can, how can this be expressed, how can the bilingual 
or any other for fire, example, being expressed, you know, the different experiences with different cultures that somebody brings if he tries to set foot and uh, create a life in a new country. Are there examples that you think are well done in this context? Well, uh, it's a bit difficult for me to uh, classically criticize literature by saying it does this or it, it doesn't do that. But in graphic novel, for example, this is something that is picked up um, very often. There are many authors, many writers that deal with this. And uh, a book that is not really meant for the, the global audience, I could use a, a local imagery, of course, in these books. I could, of course, recommend you some books. I can we can do that aside later on, but I won't do that now here. But this is something that you find very often. You mentioned already before uh, the mangas, which very clearly uses the visual narration and has completely changed that. It has been much faster in a in a, in a much quicker way. If you compare the comics and, and motion pictures um, developed, imagery of course is not linear, you see everything at the same time, and you yourself, you take the story into this imagery, into this picture book, and you have to decide, do I read it from the, from the top down or the other way around? But do I put my focus onto another picture? So, comic, of course, is an alternative to to, to narration with this in mind. So, on one hand, we have nowadays this this imagery, this picture culture. We have the, the Japanese manga aesthetics, and just simply the the game as well with uh, experimental forms of expression. For example, in an essay that uses the different registers of uh, expression, then you, the, the tone, you, uh, the sound moves into one direction, the picture into another, and the story again takes place somewhere completely else. So the simplicity of a picture that is used, for example, in Tagesschau, this is nothing that, uh, that we could compare to our uh, picture culture that we talk about here. It is something that is that is uh, based in our own picture culture, as we, for example, use the, or force the pictures to just tell one story, one of many possible stories. So I would hope, when in discussing these things, in discussing this this form of expression, that we also point our view onto the own. Um, values and with that value again the picture novel or the graphic novel in a new way in a homogeneous picture it is easy to understand but also to say I can live with the fact that there is a contradiction maybe in pictures that much more matches the world than just an, an illusion for example yes the picture with the meaning that also has to do with uh, shying away from risk for example <coughs> You used Parisia before by Foucault. This notion, it was uh, it was defined by him, and um, this reminded me of the books of Dubois, Jada, who that were presented yesterday, and that showed a certain risk. There were people that said from a certain point in, 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 in time I can start narrating this for example the boy that got to Italy and then is ready to of course with having doubts but still um, tell his story to a writer and then in the end there is this label true story on it or Mr. Poirin who had to wait until her mother had passed away until she could tell this story and uh, then decides to put her own to put her own words into uh, into uh, into a text or like Misairi did in form of theater play and a book. So this uh, this poetic notion, could you maybe say something about that before we open up the uh, the discussion here for questions from the audience? What does that 
Mm, also was used to the graphic novel, the, the, the advert to take risk. I think that it was quite helpful to show that uh, the author of course wants to tell something, one doesn't want to say anything wrong, he wants to tell about the existential experience of somebody and then talks to the, to the workers there. And this is a, a process of negotiation to build up trust and then decide that it is worth the risk uh, to do this, to tell their story. Just It's the same situation with Jada, for example, where people get to know each other and where they have to find out is it really something that we can take into the public? Yes. And for me, it is one of the, the classical examples. It does not come from child and youth literature. It's Orlando by Virginia Woolf, who starts counting uh, how many identities she actually has. And uh, I think she comes to 2052. So with that, it's, it's an act of, of social uh, contradiction. And uh, she blames society for not being allowed to take these different identities. So that, for example, is an, is an idea of how to deal with the heterogeneity. The little girl, for example, that we saw before, that just drawing a picture of herself, she's not drawing a picture, she's not living always every, with the same story, with the same uh, point of view on, on, on life. And um, I would be happy if with migratory literature we come to that point one day. It has to do with us and dealing with the other is nothing that comes out of that. It, ca it derives from dealing with ourselves. And with that uh, we have to see how flexible, how tolerant we actually are, how open to contradiction we are. If I, if I find myself that kind of might disturb me and also the people around me when I say for example if all people are standing at, uh, at, a, at a train station and hold up signs that say refugees welcome there's no risk involved of course but when I'm the first one to do that and that may be at a place where m mostly society thinks negatively about these acts of, of uh, of welcoming, then I risk something, of course. I put something at stake. And this possibility of having the, the possibility of allowing each other to fall out of our, our actual identities, uh, that's something that we shouldn't, shouldn't uh, get, leave to the, another one as a task. We have to allow ourselves to deal with this contradiction. And that's, that's it for my part. Thank you. On any questions? Yeah. I would like to come back to what you said that the that the wording takes something from the picture. When I read graphic novels, they usually are written in capitalized letters and then also in a comic writing. So just to read it, I need a lot of I need a lot of power because I'm, my my brain, of course, is not programmed in reading everything in uh, capitalized letters, and I have to figure out myself what is a what is a, a subject, for example, what is the noun, and I have a problem with that. Something you have to deal with with graphic novels or comics, and with that, the the text loses already, and the pictures with that become more important and stronger. I would put that to discussion and. Second, I would say, uh, I think it's a bit sad that graphic novel is, is something that you do not easily see on a tablet, for example, a digitalized forms, uh, because you have to see the full page, not just a part of it. Well, I don't want to, to, uh, to launch here some, some devices, but it depends, of course, on the reader. There are some very nice approaches that you um, have the possibility of looking at simple, at single pictures. But still, again, it is a contradiction in here. Uh, things become uh, become cheaper, things become uh, broader, and I, I hope that the devices will get better, as, of course, as well. But to come back to the relation between text and picture, that's something very, very uh, specific. It, it is a question of type of typography. I don't know if you talked about this yesterday already. To find out what the material is 
incarnation is of the creative novel. It is not about seeing, well, here's the book, and behind the experience or behind the perception of the story, the uh, the creation, the, the, the expression of the book vanishes. That's not something that I want as an artist. But usually in a book, of course, the, the typographic uh, expression does not play a big role because we don't uh, we don't think there's there's line much behind that. But in graphic novel, of course, it is very different. We decided uh, on a certain type uh, because it matches perfectly the book, it matches perfectly the pictures, and so on. And the same thing happens in, in comics. And not everything is written in, in capitalized letters, but. I admit that, of course, there is a, um, a certain problem to, to reading these, and maybe you should start with graphic novels that, uh, that uses no text. I think that for children and youth, uh, we should tell them if there is something missing, then we should start doing that on our own. We could then decide if we would just simply use a translation for a book or if it becomes a polyglot color wedge when everybody starts to tell stories in their mother tongues, for example. Let's see, let's see how things develop. So it needs a rethinking by us, right? If we, if we talk about graphic novels, what rethinking is, uh, do we need from children, from youth that have only read graphic novels and now start reading other literature? Well, that's a difficult question, of course. And, uh, I very often uh, tell my sons uh, who only read graphic novels, I tell them, well, read a real book, start reading something real. The so-called real book is something that stays better in mind because maybe I read it out to somebody, I am somewhere in a, in a room, we have that continuity of, of narration, which we do not have in a graphic novel. That's a completely different uh, experience of reception, but it creates that kind of a desire for a, a real book. And uh, I haven't found a solution for that, not even in my private life. But I think I'm kind of part of a transit generation. I'm a, a huge fan of... Uh, or a, a, a culturally coined person by books and uh, also a central machine. I see that as a central machine in social change for migration and so on. And I haven't found anything better for that. Let's see if computer games, for example, can, can use that, uh, can, can manage to do that as well. I hope that something new will come in the future. There is another, there is another question. And we need the microphone for the translation. It is very uh, interesting to take a look at your own contradictions, but where are the limits to that? In, where do you find your own limits in this? The uh, discussion of the, six, of the generation of 68 has gone a bit differently in France than in Germany. For example, people that were dedicated in uh, psychology and uh, where do, do I have something that uh, that is considered a disease like bipolarity, for example, schizophrenia? What can I learn from that when dealing with motives, with different identities in everyday life? And I think it is more difficult than they thought in the end, because there were reasons for our coexistence in society, the organization for our con-living in, uh, in society. We had to find norms for that in Salon, for example, we have the discussion now at the moment of how to change these norms with views to migration, how do we have to reorganize the con-living, the teaching and so on for to create inclusion and to create space that we uh, as, as mainstream, for example, a couple of years ago, did not apply to these norms. It's a question that I myself cannot answer, but we've discu been discussing that for quite a while. And this perception that comes from that time, the, the, the discussions from the 60s, the 70s, 
that the stable I is, the stable me is, a, is an exception, it's nothing that we should uh, orientate with or that we should cling to, it's nothing that we should, uh, should favor in life, but that this incredible psychic existential um, stress that this is something that we should uh, that we should have to try and reorganize in our lives and also with use to politics because we won't otherwise be able to deal with what our cultural minister just mentioned before and also warned us about we will have ten thousands of children in our schools of whom the majority is traumatized and if we now just simply say we continue with the teaching that um, derives from uh, from a psychological standard situation, then we have a problem, and we're asked as parents, as neighbors, as teachers, of course, in this situation, but also on a social and a psychological level, this is a, a huge experiment on society for society. But it has to work. We have to find solutions to this. We have no, uh, no other possibility. So the question is, how, in how far are we willing to use our uh, idea of the normal and to question this idea of the normal in this situation? It sounds very negative, actually, but, but it isn't. I would like to come back to the children and the youth, uh, the, the young audience that actually the graphic novel is meant for. And uh, I wonder, it actually is quite a deterioring genre that uh, you need an intellectual perception for that actually means that you need a certain knowledge before and a certain understanding. Um, uh, for a graphic novel, very often graphic novels are very complex, they are quite, uh, quite expensive, like you said, about 30 euros. And I wonder, does the graphic novel actually reach this audience, this young audience, or is it rather the, the 30 years old and, and upwards that, uh, that buy these graphic novels? In, in contrast to Superman, for example, or what else is on the market. So we're talking about a genre that has not really arrived where it is actually meant to arrive, because it has so much to say. Well, the genre itself is in discussion now. In how far is there this genre of graphic novel? There are uh, well-known comic artists uh, that say that graphic novel is not really a uh, comic. Well, people are arguing, arguing about this genre, and if you, if you argue about it, you see the differences, of course. Uh, I count myself uh, to the 30 year olds and older. And, uh, our graphic novel symposium, we, we recall that comic symposium. Because beyond from the argumentation, graphic novels is just a marketing gag. Um, it's not really wrong, but it's not also right. It's kind of a writer's comic that was established with a, with a very large freedom, which does not uh, only have to be uh, something intellectual uh, food for people that before read Superman. But to come to your question, I think you should address the publishing houses as well here in Sydney. You, you could you could talk to me for that. Uh, you have to ask the publishing houses uh, for a cooperation to give them the license for certain graphic novels in a less expensive edition for schools, for example, and I see possibilities there. Because the, the collective items, for example, are of course very, very expensive. There are many expensive things, as these are huge projects. The publishing houses are really are small. If you take a look at graphicmindsnovel.info, you find a lot of very small publishing houses. And if you see what they do in translating and in, in, in transmission, it's it's really something that is easy overseeable. But if you take them into a corporation and then start making a list of people uh, who could deal with this topic, then uh, you can of course reach another audience. I think this is something very exciting. Also maybe to choose some pictures that are not that 
didactical, didactically uh, conceived, saying, ah, this is what it's like in Syria, but are that open to discussion, just like the ones that we presented here? We have to talk about that later on, maybe. But I think it's it's very exciting to do that in the future. I cannot give you any numbers, any figures. Um, who's, who's reading these novels later on, who's, who's perceiving them? Uh, that's of course something that we would have to find out through libraries, for example. Who are the ones that that, uh, that lend these pictures? I sometimes uh, lend four or five books and take some of them back to the library again, and some I keep for longer, so we have to try and find out um, how to get some, some figures on this. With, uh, with institutions that have this data and with that come to the conclusions of how to deal with your, with your question, with what is in question here. Thank you very much. So I think that um, now we will close this and we will have a coffee break. Now.